Down but not out, Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has been away for weeks getting medical treatment. And his long absence is creating uncertainty in Africa's most populous country. So what will this mean for Nigeria and the region? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. All eyes were on Washington, D.C. as President Donald Trump took office roughly 40 days ago. But at the same time, a much quieter transition of power was also happening half a world away in Nigeria. President Mohamedou Buhari flew to London in mid-January to be treated for an undisclosed medical condition. Vice President Yemi Osimbajo is temporarily leading the country. But opposition leaders say Buhari has been out of the country for too long and should now resign. We've got a lot of uh, questions to get to with our guests, but first, this report from Ahmed Idris in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. This was the moment President Muhammadu Buhari came to office, carrying the weight of expectations of many Nigerians. He'd, among others, promised to root out corruption and fight Boko Haram. The president took on the fight against corruption, prosecuting politicians and government officials. His military also drove out Boko Haram fighters from most of the territory they occupied. Then illness. His foreign medical trips as president began last year for an ear infection. Then on January 19 of this year, Buhari left Nigeria for an ailment the government has failed to provide details. Since then, his deputy has been acting as president. Even though you have an acting president, uh, certain decisions are not being taken. Uh, certain things that should have been done are not being done. And uh, for a lot of Nigerians, it's almost like we are at a standstill, and this is quite worrying. Buhari's absence was different from 2010, when an ailing president, the late Umaru Eradua, failed to delegate authority to his deputy until the Nigerian parliament intervened. The biggest concern for many Nigerians, especially Buhari supporters, is a lack of information on two issues. The true nature of the president's health and when he will come back. But the opposition says the 74-year-old Buhari should simply step aside. Government officials have brushed aside this suggestion. For anybody to suggest that, uh, that, that, that the president uh, should uh, move out of office or be impeached is just, uh, just to be funny, it's just to be ridiculous. It is not warranted it is not even constitutional. There are also those who simply don't care. I am indifferent, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, I mean, I am one of those Nigerians that have lost faith in the system, to be perfectly honest. I lost faith in the system. So whatever happens, fine and good. Yeah? Last week, President Buhari spoke to his aides, assuring them he's getting better. But that may not be as reassuring to those who are worried. His absence has left Nigeria in a climate of uncertainty and rumors. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Abuja. Well, let's take a closer look at the man who's taken Buhari's place. Yemi Osimbajo became vice president in 2015. Before that, he was a lawyer, he was also a pastor, and helped write the manifesto for the ruling party, the All Progressives Congress. But over the past few weeks, Osimbajo has signed contracts to build better roads and bridges. He's visited the Niger Delta to discourage attacks on oil and gas pipelines. Supporters even say he's been more efficient than Buhari. But the government insists the vice president is simply acting on Buhari's orders. Let's bring in our guests into the show. We have joining us from Abuja, Max Banite, counterterrorism expert and the chairman of the Maximus Research and Analysis Center, which focuses on defense and security in Nigeria. In London, we have Manji Cheto, vice president of Tenio Intelligence, which focuses on the political economy of sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you both uh, for joining us. We could start with Manji. So, what has been confirmed, first of all, about the president's state of health? 
So far, what we know is that it was actually quite unusual that um, his office even confirmed that he was going to be on medical leave. I mean, if you remember back in 2009, 2010, when the then president, um, late um, Umar Yaradua, left the country, that was um, undisclosed um, information to Nigeria when he was um, receiving treatment. So I think for um, for now, I mean, it's even quite it's quite surprising, and I think pleasantly surprising, that the, um, President Buhari's office has confirmed this. However, what is starting to get a lot of Nigerians feeling frustrated with the government is the fact that they have not disclosed the exact nature of the condition and, and the gravity or the seriousness of what the president is facing. And that also leaves the question over, you know, will he return? Should he return? And also, should he permanently abdicate his powers? All right. Well, let me take the question to Max. Why are authorities being so tight lipped? I agree with you. I want to know more, just like you. I have that curiosity. Um, having trained in the United States and lived in the U.S. for over three decades. But Nigeria is dynamic, and Nigeria has a way of doing its own thing. If you look at the precedence of the Musa Uyaradua era, there was what was then called a cabal that made sure that nobody knew what was going on until the doctrine of necessity was implemented because the president failed to transfer power. But in this particular case, the president said to Nigerians that he was going on medical vacation. And he did the needful based on the constitution by transferring power to the vice president, asking him to act as the president. And uh, that, to me, is, is acceptable. But the handlers of the president, I can agree with you, have mismanaged the information about his health, the information about his communication to Nigerians. All right, well, on that point, and let me jump in, Max, if I may. Uh, you said Nigeria is dynamic. They have a different way of doing things, though. Doesn't the country really need, Max, though, some kind of idea, some kind of timeline of when he's coming back? Well, I, I don't agree with that one in terms of timeline or when he's coming back. If he did not transfer power to the vice president to act, then I will be worried. And uh, the way the vice president has been operating shows that the president chose the right man for the job. Now, the president is up to him to tell Nigerians when he's going to come back. As a Nigerian, I would like to think like an American. I would like to ask for a timeline. When is my president coming back? Is he coming back in the next four months, five months, six months? But there are no answers to that. Because Abi Nishio, the SA media, and the handlers of the okay. president. OK, I can see Manji wants to get in on here. Go ahead, Have Manji. Have they done the right thing? Yeah, so yes. I, I think one of the things that um, is, is quite concerning here is um, what I call, you know, Brand Buhari. I mean, this was a president who ran his campaign um, promising Nigerians that business as usual was not going to be the business of the day and that there's going to be a degree of transparency about his government. So effectively to have his government and, and the people that are responsible for the, for the management of, of that brand, that Brand Buhari, um, contravene the same principles that they've promised Nigerians. I think for a lot of Nigerians that seems like quite a disappointment. Um, and I agree. I mean, I think, you know, questions around a uh, power vacuum, I think that's a very overstated risk. It's quite clear President Buhari has taken the right decision um, by constitutionally handing over powers, the powers of his office to his vice president. But there's still questions over to what extent does his vice president feel empowered to take bolder policy risks that may or may not contravene President Buhari's um, own position on these issues. And I think this is really where the, the concern is for Nigerians, because it's creating a governance problem, a governability problem, rather than just one of a power vacuum. I think the power vacuum question is really not, not as relevant as it was in 2009, 2010. But the question over governance and to what extent Osibanjo feels that he is empowered and he can take decisions in, in, in his role as acting president, that is going, going to continue to be the, the, the issue that, right. that underlies um, the question of Bahari's absence. Let, let me give uh, a chance to Max to come back in on that. Do you agree with that analysis that there may be a as, management as, issue as, going as on? As a non-political actor, 
as a non-political actor, I don't think there is a power vacuum. The vice president, I've heard, speaks to his boss on a daily basis, and he has not taken decisions that are contrary to the Buhari brand. Everything that the vice president is doing today or is seen to be doing today is something his boss, President Buhari, will approve. And I say this without equivocation. I am not in any political party. I am a security man. And the vice president, in my own view, seems to be doing well. However, the 12 or 13 million people that didn't vote for Muhammadu Buhari and the online spectators have found a way to re-engineer the word power vacuum by insisting that there is a power vacuum. There is no power vacuum. There is an acting president, and he is doing the job. Okay, all right. For let his me, boss. Let, let me take down Buhari. I did Buhari, I'm quite that sure there was a power vacuum. Go ahead, Manji. And just to clarify that point, I mean, I have also stated that I don't think there's a question of a power mm -hmm. vacuum. I think the question is really one of governability. To what extent? I mean, yes, the president's office has told us that Yemio Sibanjo is acting on directions from, uh, from the president, yet we don't know, I mean, beyond what they've told us, we don't know that President Buhari is in the condition that they say he is, that he's healthy and hearty. I mean, if, for a lot of Nigerians, if he is healthy and hearty, why don't we know when the president is coming back to the country? And also, why don't we actually see him? Why doesn't he communicate with a lot of Nigerians? I mean, I think there's no way to wish away these perception problems. There, there, there is a perception problem. There is a perception gap. And his office needs to do a much, be much better job of addressing that concern. All right. You've touched on a number of issues there. I'm going to try and take them uh, to I pieces agree with one, Manji one by on one. That level. I agree with Manji on the issue of the questionability of a timeline of the president returning. I am curious also, I would like to know. Okay. But the dynamics of Nigeria and the system in Nigeria makes it unattainable. Okay. The people you, that are running that the government you've made have that point, their own Max. set of minds on how to do things. They definitely have and their own mindset. That. They have, definitely have their own mindset. But here's my question, Max. Even if there isn't a power vacuum right now, when you have a situation where a leader is overseas, his state of health is in doubt, and there's no date for his return and no update on what his state is. Isn't that the perfect environment to nurture, I don't want to say a power struggle, but at least to nurture ambitions for power? That can lead to a power struggle later. Well, there's always an opportunity for power struggle. But democracy has come to stay in Nigeria. And that power struggle has to be within the ruling party called APC. But the well, it can always be a democratic a power struggle, but a, a, a power struggle nevertheless. Now, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. The opposition, who are the PDP and the rest of the parties, have not up the ant. They have not questioned. They have not demanded enough from the ruling party. And the ruling party is very comfortable the way things are going. And there seems to be... A, a new shift or paradigm shift in the way things are happening in the country. The, the, the central bank came up with new policies. The vice president have gone to the Niger Delta to discuss on the blueprint for, again, rebuilding the area. And he has, he's doing tours of the nation. So in his party, one can even see a seismic discussion of a of a power tussle, but it's not yet in the fall. Okay. That will come let, in let me move by 2019 may, let me move in case the Manji. president is incapacitated. Right, let me take the point to Manji. I mean, what do you yes. make of reports, Manji, that talk about a block of Buhari appointees coming together to try and undermine the influence of the acting president, that there's already some jockeying going on?
So I think to that point, um, I think anyone who has been a long-term watcher of Nigeria, particularly starting um, from 2014 when the um, election campaign started for 2015, it was quite clear that the um, All Progressive Congress Party, um, which is effectively a loose coalition of interest, you know, that, that power struggles were going to happen in that party. I think the big question, however, the Buhari's um, absence or, or the, the sort of um, span in the works that Buhari's absence throws into that um, mix is that if you were expecting this power struggle to begin to happen in the lead up to 2019 elections, I think Buhari's absence has accelerated um, that power struggle. We've certainly already started hearing rumours um, of um, the southwest um, bloc of the APC, which effectively uh, a lot of people see that as the economic um, um, base of, of the APC, starting to sort of um, rally into into um, power to, to, to try to wrest control um, of the party. And I think all of these things, to be honest, are quite negative for Nigeria going forward because as power struggles repeatedly across a number of African countries have been shown to, to um, minimize government effectiveness. And for a lot of Nigerians to have a government that isn't focused um, and, and focused on sort of internal power dynamics, I mean, it's, it's really, really destabilizing. We've just seen um, GDP growth results come out for Nigeria for 2016. It's the first um, full year contraction that the country has suffered, coming at a time where, um, you know, if, if you, you, you've got threats of a power struggle in the country, I think it's, it's a lot of Nigerians. Nigerians would just really be frustrated. Well, what's frustrating for Nigeria can be frustrating for the entire continent. Let's not forget Nigeria has one of the largest economies in Africa. It faces many problems, though. Buhari has said corruption is the very worst of all the problems confronting his country. Then there's, of course, Boko Haram. Man, Buhari said the army defeated the group, but there are still attacks in the northeast. Falling oil prices have hit the Nigerian economy hard. Unemployment has doubled since Buhari took office. And there's been unrest in the southern region of Biafra, where protesters say they want more autonomy. Clearly a lot of issues uh, here, Max, and it's not just issues for Nigeria. This is, a, this is a major player on the African continent, the Africa's number two oil supplier, one of the continent's largest economies. Any problems in Nigeria are going to have implications beyond its borders, right? You are very correct about that. But let me just say that the issues you have just raised, the points you have just raised, have always been there. I am from the part of Nigeria that is southeast that is agitating for separation. But I am a Nigerian, and I am not agitating for separation. It's the minority group within that particular region that are agitating for that, and it has become a political weapon for 2019. Now, coming back to this power tussle, there has always been a power tussle in the ruling party since the amalgamation of ACN, CPC, and all the other political groups that formed together to remove PDP out of power. Even before the president went overseas for medical, there have always been rumors that there is a tussle between him and the leader of the Southwest group, uh, Aswaju Bolatinobu, and they have managed to keep that under caps. And uh, there was also an incident where it appeared the chairman of the party was about to be removed, but he has stabilized the party so far. So those rumors will continue. The issue now is that the Niger Delta region have again reduced the number of pipeline vandalization and Nigeria is about to begin to optimize its oil production. And like you have rightly said, any hiccups in Nigeria is a hiccup in Africa and will also have a resounding effect in other international communities because of Nigeria's right. partnership with other regions of All the right. world. All right. However, the issue of Boko Haram, Nigerian government have, to the best of my knowledge, as a security and counterterrorism expert, degraded the ability of Boko Haram to hold any space in the country. So Boko Haram have gone back to what they were before, fighting a symmetrical war, okay. and then using shahids, in this case, suicide bombers, to 
create panic. All right, let me that take some of those points. You, you, made, to fight. you made some Even good points. The let me take them, if I may, to, to Manji and ask the or, question, you know, are we being a little too alarmist at this point? The country hasn't fallen to pieces. There are, you know, some good signs. Progress have, has been made, although problems do persist. Um, Max has pointed out the fall in the number of attacks on uh, pipelines in the Niger Delta area, the, the stabilization of the currency or progress towards that that's been made since the vice president took over. He's ordered the construction of new roads. He's signed or unveiled a $20 billion plan to develop a gas industrial park. I mean, there's plenty of good news too. It may not be perfect. Why are we getting all worked up at this point, Manji? Um, it's not for me. It's not a question of being alarmist. I don't really think that you know Buhari's absence will mean that the country falls apart. But I, like I said earlier, I think if we were expecting a power struggle um, to emerge within the APC in 2018, for example, I mean Buhari's absence is only accelerating that process and sort of bringing it forward. And that's on on unwanted distraction for um, you know acting president um, Yemil Sibanjo because as you rightly pointed out, he still needs to deal with all these issues. I mean, he signed, you know, contracts for road building. His, um, the central bank seems to be moving towards uh, a, a more um, flexible exchange rate system. Um, that's still yet to be determined. He's gone out to the Niger Delta to, to, um, to begin the negotiation process. Um, all of these things are steps in the right direction. But unfortunately, if we do get a power struggle that bubbles to the surface, it becomes a huge distraction for him at a time when he clearly needs to be doubling down and pushing through with a lot of the um, what positive measures he's taken, and Nigerians are actually quite happy for that. All right, let me take a point which Manji made several times, I think, in the show so far, Max. How do we know if this is really the president's initiative or this is the acting president's uh, um, energy, shall we say, the, the steps that have been taken? Isn't that important to know? <laughs> That's a very good question to ask. There is a policy agenda that was developed when the party took over. And I think the, pres the acting president is carrying out the policy agenda of the party and not necessarily that of the president, but that of the party. And the president gave tacit approval because they, in my own investigation, they did review some of these roadmaps in terms of bringing the country out of the wood woodworks. And these are the roadmaps that the acting president is following. So the, what the acting president have injected is, is his own personal energy to make sure that these things are carried out immediately, but not necessarily that these are his own initiations. Now, the issue of power struggle... Uh, okay, hang, hang on, hang on. We've talked about power struggle. Max, forgive me for, for interrupting and jumping in here, but I, I think Manji wants to, to have a word. And we, we've talked about power struggle, so I'm going to give her a chance. We'll come back to you, Max. Sorry. Just to play devil's advocate here, I mean, to, to what extent, I think a lot of Nigerians looking at this will say, okay, if, if effectively what the vice president is doing is the e APC's manifesto, why has it taken 20 months for this to be kicked into action? Why has it taken um, Yemi Sibanjo taking over the office of the acting president for all you, of these You took the to words happen? out my mouth, Manji. So let me take that point to, to Max. That is the big question. Look, if this was all the president's initiatives anyway, was he really waiting for his health to deteriorate before he would activate this? I mean, something doesn't add up here, does it? Look, nothing, nothing happens before his time. It took Donald Trump less than one week to constitute his cabinet in the United States. All of them have not been approved yet by the Senate. And it took Buhari almost a year to constitute his ministerial appointments. So nothing happens before his time. I'm not going to, again, second guess why these things are happening now that the president is on medical leave and it didn't happen before. The war against corruption is ongoing and has been going on and hasn't stopped. And the war against Boko Haram is ongoing and hasn't stopped. The issue right. of central bank reviewing its monetary policy is 
Again, something that has been ongoing. They have been trying all kinds of economic monetary policies. All right, I'm Until afraid, now, Max, they we came are, up with the one that may work. We are running out And they are not time. even sure if it's going to work. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Let's thank our guests, Max Benite and Manji Cheto. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.